the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I have a fascinating channeling to share with you today that goes into the origins of the universe and the earth and is from Marjorie Livingston. We have covered Marjorie Livingston in another episode where I read the book, The New Nuctemeron, which was a channeled work from Apollonius of Tiana. The original channeling that I read came from Ashar, priest of Ra, Zavdael, and the Hierophant of Apollonius of Tiana. These are former humans that have reached a certain level and were able to communicate through a medium to Marjorie Livingston. Here, we get a full explanation of the origins of the earth, the tree of life, Atlantis is mentioned, all kinds of fascinating bits of knowledge are mentioned and take of it as you will. It's just interesting when I hear channeled works that go into detail about the origins of the earth, the Garden of Eden, and all those wonderful things. An account of the origins of earth. Excerpts concerning Genesis from an outline of existence, 1933 by Marjorie Livingston. The first creation radiated from God as an aura of magnetism, energy, and thought, and became the first cosmic radix and the primordial orbit of created life. The first creation was possessed of cosmic consciousness. Its mind was one with the parent mind of the father-mother God. It was the issue of the first act of creation, which was emanation. It now underwent the process of individualization and of expansion. Out of this sublime reservoir of pure spirit, there began to form individual nuclei. Light begat darkness, that the positive gave rise to the negative principle, in order that by coordination they should produce experience, which is the foundation of ecstasy. Absolute light could have had no conscious existence, only the comparison of darkness could have made it comprehensible to the mind. Absolute good would have produced inertia within the evolving fetus of the primal ego. God is the supreme macrocosm, the positive principle emanating from this, the negative principle in this aspect is embodied the macrocosm. In the beginning, God, all life is invested in him, all knowledge, all intelligence, all consciousness. This is the supreme macrocosm, the father, God, the positive principle emanating from this aspect of the being of all life is the negative aspect, the source of all life, the mother God, or negative principle. In this aspect is embodied the microcosm, which contains within itself the potential faculties of the parental macrocosm. All spirit then is of God and is immaculate. Creation occurs where the great principle of life acquires individual consciousness. The ego grew slowly through many ages into positive consciousness and remained as yet unborn in the matrix of the cosmic mother until its growth enabled it to suffer birth as a self-directing entity here began the cosmic eden of which the earth's eden was a reenactment spirit acquired form or bodies in which the vibrations of light and color were creative elements and which belong to a dimension beyond your conception at present the divine consciousness individualized in personalities created an environment which was the first world. The earth stirred and pulsated with manifestations of life, but not with organic existence. Meantime, the sons of God, the children of the sun, increased in number as a race, drawing upon the vast reservoir of life and giving the wherewithal for manifestation to individualizing spirits. They inhabited the spheres of light which encircled the formless plains of earth. So the earth then was a sphere within a sphere. The earth plane in its inception was a location for the expansion of consciousness. In the beginning, the divine wisdom of God was within the fetus of the ego. Individualizing man sought expansion and experience. His impulse was from the center outward upon the arc of involution. The ego thus has two parallel lines of evolution before him, the evolution of the spirit, still divine integrally, but still undeveloped as an intelligent unit, and the evolution of the body by which he may acquire a form that will enable him to manifest in conditions that will furnish him with the experience necessary 
to the development of his spirit. Energy turned against the force of its own current and produced the cataclysm which was the origin of evil. Beings used the divine force within themselves to counter the principle of divine force which was God. This act, through the velocity of the contact, projected them far into space. Here was a race, divine in origin, imperfectly developed and already encompassed by alien conditions. The perfect form in which these personalities had clothed themselves was lost to them because the delicate vibrations were dispersed by the shock of collision of forces. The band of partially developed spirits under a leader used their free will to collide with the immaculate power of which they themselves were a part, and the chemical force of this collision projected them into conditions from which sprung the extreme density of matter. Here the ego possesses a state of consciousness without a brain through which may function intelligence. This state implies no human form, though it may imply a certain degree of manifestation. When the time was ripe, he was enabled to manipulate the animal protoplasm and incarnate in a body formed of the elements of earth. There came into existence a race of imperfectly individualized spirits who, having utilized their free will for purposes of rebellion, had been hurled as a natural consequence of their own inverse action into the outposts of matter, a state which was in itself an emanation of their own folly and a part and parcel of their own subverted conditions. The fallen lord of darkness became a creative lord, but he built the dark spheres of the lower astral. The structure of these is synthetic and shall not outlast the celestial fire. These personalities were dependent upon the inherent creative power within themselves to provide themselves anew with the withal in which to manifest, and since they had perverted the divine nature functioning within them, the forms in which they were able to clothe themselves suffered a like perversion. From being subtle, they became solidified in relation to their surroundings. From being magnetic, they became dense, and thus, through ages of stupendous effort, there developed the first world of matter. The earth plane was for the expansion of consciousness. To it came upwards the fallen souls out of the darkness that they might avail themselves of the opportunities offered to them through the medium of incarnation into a body of flesh. And hither came also the young souls hitherto immune from aught but higher influences that they may be given the test of evil contacts in order to try out the strength of their own nature. They were not forced to make this essay, these children of the sun. They were sufficiently developed to use their own free will. Children of the sun were sufficiently developed to undertake this ordeal of their own wish and consent. Each individualizing ego had learned that within the cosmos there are many tests and trials to be passed before the microcosm may claim those attributes which are the prerogative of the macrocosm. When the sons of God came earthward, they came knowing the penalty of repeated failure. The divine life withdraws. They were aware of their mission to the children of men and the importance of the secrets with which they were entrusted. The earth planet, once of one body with the sun, separated itself from its center in order to be individualized to become a separate planet. It is now complete within itself, yet dependent ever upon the parent source of its existence, moving in its orbit and absorbing light and life force, just so the individual ego sprang from God and has become an entity separate yet dependent upon the Godhead, and an integral part of the cosmic system of unity. Thus, the microcosm is ever symbolical of the macrocosm. The earth itself is not so much a creation as an emanation. It was projected from the substance of the sun. It is some 600 million years of your own time reckoning since the body of the earth first stirred within the matrix of the sun. So within a period of time intelligible to the brain of man, a new planet was born into the universe. Its matter was purposely created gross and dense upon its inner planes, for it was dedicated as a temple of development for those wandering souls who had been participators in the fall. Long before those planes, which to you are the material world, were sufficiently developed to produce the protoplasm necessary to the life germ, the higher cycles of the earth planet were replete with life. These realms you speak of now as the astral and etheric spheres, and they are actually surfaces or globes within your own earth life 
and encircling and containing it. Before your own matter had cooled and crystallized, the outer planes of earth were inhabited by such beings as you would term gods or supermen. The earth planet is composed of a number of surfaces or cycles, each within the other. The population of the earth began as the outmost cycle and worked, and in fact is working still inwards towards the vortex. The etheric realms of earth were inhabited at its inception by the children of the sun, and as their influence helped to cool the elements and to shape matter into form, so plane after plane became inhabited by spirits who incarnated into its conditions and whom you would call the sons of God or the Adamic race. Plane after plane became inhabited by spirits. This incarnation was spontaneous, the ego acquiring form from the material elements and emerging in embryo protected by its own fluidic auric ovoid and gaining substance by a spontaneous absorption of the chemical constituents within the ether. These beings were divinely originated and assumed form or incarnation that they might be in affinity with the plane to which they were come. These beings were divinely originated. Their approach to the physical state was not purposeless. They came for their own initiation, for their own trial and confirmation, for their own experience and evolution of consciousness. They were also a link between the creative spirits and the planet of their creation. Their task was to penetrate from the four-dimensional region of their birth into a world of three-dimensional matter that they might aid in the development of those forms of life which had sprung from the darkness and the void. A band of chosen spirits became the guardians of the earth, working under a supreme ruler which is the Christ. They were spirits who had incarnated upon the sun and were come to assist in the preparation of the earth for human occupation. To them was known the language of the stars, the science of sound and rhythm, and the wisdom of the Almighty Mind which is instilled into the cosmic fluids. When the surface of matter became habitable, they incarnated into it, not by physical birth, but by the spontaneous attraction of elements of earth. These personalities had intercourse with the minds of angels. They were able to watch the formation of their own world about them, and to apply the creative principles to the material world upon the inferior plane. Thus the forms of the celestial world were reproduced in the terrestrial, but in the gross material of the physical earth. They worked in obedience to those creative spirits whose purpose was the formation of order and of chaos, the actual designing of a geographical sphere and the procreation of life which should be suitable to its conditions. These spirits worked in the power of the Most High and under the direction of the Christ ruler. God created heaven and earth. This work was accomplished in seven cycles, seven ages of cosmic life. When the work of formation had reached the Earth's vortex, its existence as an individual planet became established, and its inhabitants became definitely integrated into its sphere of being. Their task still lay in the work of evolving life in the spheres below their own. The first garden was the Garden of the Lord, Eden, existed within your planet. Unprogressed souls did not enter the earth for millions of years after its inception. It was in the possession of the nature divas of fire, water, and air, and controlled by the sons of God who had journeyed with it from the body of the sun. These spirits, or gods, inhabited its outermost spheres. They were the Ruach Elohim, who brooded upon the face of the void. In the first place, then, the earth was formless according to physical acceptance of form. It consisted of terrestrial essences within, the celestial essences without. There was a heavenly Eden. And there was the earthly Eden, a garden in the earth's astral into which state had incarnated the children of the sun, the individualizing spirits or gods. These were the ray children not born of flesh but attracted to the earth through love. They came from the vast reservoir of life seeking individualization in the school of experience they acted as the ambassadors of God to aid the fallen race of mankind, striving for development on the evolving planes. These spirits worked. Their task lay in the work of evolving life. Some had charge over the mineral elements which existed far into the earth's interior. The sun was given ascendance over volcanic elements that they might build the mountains and design basins for the seas. 
Others worked upon the evolution of bird and insect life, whilst others directed the evolving of the animal into an organism that should eventually be used as a physical envelope for the elementary ego incarnating from a lower sphere of life. The elements crystallized to form the sphere of Earth and brought forth the minerals that are of its substance. Upon this foundation the waters condensed and the vegetable kingdom sprang into manifestation. From the union of these kingdoms emerged the organic body, and from the vehicle of the animal form were drawn those juices that gave incarnation to the human soul. Lastly, within the human organism manifested angelic beings from the divine world. Man is set between the two poles, from the one he may gain experience, from the other, immortality. Physical creation operates in inverse ratio to spiritual creation. All diversity of matter is the emanation of one mind. Of your known cosmic populace, the angels came first in the order of creation. From this order sprang the human race, whose volition led them into the crucible of experience. The animal world was created of a baser form of matter, and the natural order were consequent upon the formation of physical planets to accommodate the children of men. Creation proceeded from the center outward to produce chemical forms of increasing density. Beings from a fourth dimensional sphere descended to manifest in a higher form of matter in order they might aid in the Earth's development as a separate sphere or planet and to inspire and enlighten the progressing souls newly incarnating into matter. Many of those who live amongst you now come as guides have always come to you out of the spheres of spirit and from the astral world. These had made a voluntary descent in order that the great work of the earth plane might be accelerated. The Garden of Eden was not a physical actuality upon your present plane, but it was a material reality in the planes of etheric matter. Here, the Jehovah of the Hebrews and the Hove of Greek mythology were enabled to walk with men in the cool of the day, in the period when the etheric plane of earth had cooled sufficiently after the day's work of creation. The ether of the earth became engrossed so that this plane could no longer retain its highest state but sank downwards and became incorporated with the present crust of the world. In those early days, matter as you know it was evolving into form and developing potentialities which enabled it to become the material body of higher and higher forms of evolutionary life. The earth was a mass of matter in solution, fiery, gaseous, steaming, rotating. Forces indiscernible to matter were controlling and directing all manifestation. A band of chosen spirits, archangels, accompanied the evolving earth on its journey from the sun. Plane after plane became inhabited by spirits. Becoming spiritually from the source of infinite life, they were created in the image of God, formed of the chemical material of the planet to which they were born. They were created of the dust of the ground. These were the offspring of the marriage of spirit with matter. Their fathers had been the children of the sun, and they themselves were come to replenish the earth to populate the etheric spheres of the new planet with life in manifestation. And to them was given dominion over those forms of life which were seeking expression in matter. There was another race, the spirits who had followed the Prince of Darkness in the primal fall and had lost all individuality, all development of mind, and were evolving through the dimensions of consciousness till with incarnation into the earth, they arrived at a three-dimensional condition of existence. These were fleeing from their laders. They constituted what is known as the subhuman race, the daughters of men. In those early days, human egos or evolving intelligences were incarnating into the astral planes which lie above and without the surface which is the crust of your material earth. When the animal kingdom was perfected, the physical organisms available were assembled by the divine human spirits in their process of individualizing. The intelligence of the animal never developed into a human intelligence. The latter is a direct radiation of the divine, whilst animals belong to subsidiary lines of evolution, the work of the creative lords. Man led by the dark angel created imperfection through the perversion of divine essences. He became responsible for matter left to himself. There was no escape from its density, for he had created a monster he could not control. So the Father God sent his creative lords to help those souls in darkness to take their dense matter and manipulate it. 
So the holy Elohim came into the darkness, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The work of the creative lords was not to build a heaven, but an earth, not a sphere of exaltation, but a planet in the orbit of the sun, to provide a plane of experience for those discarnate beings who had already reached the state of human souls. I am speaking of the species of humanity who evolved upon the earth plane, utilizing animal bodies as vehicles for incarnation and consequent development. Those who inhabited the etheric planes were the inhabitants of Eden and of pristine Atlantis. The creative lords could but direct the supreme force of life into form and manifestation, and this was their work. The fallen lord of darkness had this knowledge, for he also was of like origin, but he had subjected himself to perversion. He also became a creative lord, but he built the dark spheres of the lower astral, yet because the power he used was not true, but perverted, the structure of these spheres is synthetic and shall not outlast the test of celestial fire, but shall melt atom from atom, and God shall wield them again. Animals, flowers, nature spirits, and minerals are the work of the creative lords, working in the divine power and utilizing the divine essence. All life is the outpouring of the celestial energy and is therefore the creation of God. But it is revealed in varying aspects and these diverse forms of life are not to be confounded. The manifest kingdoms are linked, not by confusion of substance, but by unity. Each order progresses upon its own separate line of evolution, but all emerged fundamentally from the same source of life, and all shall return eventually to the same destination. The consciousness of a monkey never developed into the intelligence of a man. Man's intelligence was evolving before animal life in its physical form appeared upon the earth planet. The acquisition of a material body by a protoplasmic organism enabled the human ego to incarnate upon a new plane and experience a new phase of existence. The first human ego that utilized the protoplasmic juices of the ape in order to incarnate became the first man. This was not the first human soul. These had existed already in great numbers. The first human ego was the first evolving intelligence to manifest in a physical body upon the present world of matter. The earth, therefore, having sprung from the parent sun and become a planet in the universe, had two separate and distinct types of inhabitants. The one was an unprogressed, evolving ego emerging from two-dimensional conditions and incarnating it into a three-dimensional world. The other inhabitants were beings from a four-dimensional sphere who descended through the earth's etheric cycles. The termination of this period known to you as the Garden of Eden coincided approximately with the commencement of your era of civilization. The ego was enabled to incarnate in a body. This, in earth life, was the ascending race, or man. The inhabitants of the Garden of Eden were the descending race, or the gods. So there was a heavenly Eden, the macrocosm, where the first manifested life was divided by the retrograde action of the first free will, and there was the earthly Eden, the microcosm, where the first life was divided by the fall. The soul of the world released from the womb of time was born with the birth of your planet. Its first actions were primitive, as are the actions of a babe. It was guided by the Oversoul, the Lord of the world, and so it created organisms through which the imprisoned spirit within the atom might exhale the breath of manifestation. So life began upon the earth. Simple forms of life, the soul of the world grew older and obeyed the Lord's of creation. The will is essentially positive and dynamic, and therefore masculine in quality. In the inner teaching of your book of law, it is symbolized as the man Adam. Adam symbolized the first true man who trod upon the soil of your plane of earth. He symbolized also in the inner mystery the faculty of the will, the prerogative of the children of God. The greater Adam is the human will. The greater Eve is the feminine principle, the receptive faculty in whose womb matures the celestial seed of understanding that shall replenish the world. The lesser Eve was the desire in man's heart which led him to oppose the power which had created him. Eve may covet the fruit of knowledge which is power. Adam by eating puts into action that which the desire nature has conceived, thus disobedience is consummated. The Lord God gave unto Adam the first generated soul a wife, and the wife which he gave unto him was drawn from the essence of his own being, and she imparted the faculty of equilibrium 
and became the first negative or receptive principle. The Lord God permitted the separation of the ego into two personalities, or the translation of the law of equilibrium into the law of sex. The lesser Adam with his wife, the lesser Eve being aspects of the greater Adam, still maintain the balance of polarity within their own constitution. In the world of the unmanifest, the one is all-sufficing. In the first world of manifestation, the two is expedient, and shall be reabsorbed into unity in the last cycle of evolution. So in the simple history of the first lovers is concealed a great cosmic mystery. Adam, the cosmic principle, is the positive power of human will. The cosmic Eve is the matrix of human desire. Adam the man and Eve the woman possessed and still possess within themselves both will and desire. The story of the fall is the story of the degradation of pure desire into perverted desire and free will into self-will. The greater Eden is a state of being, and not a country. The lesser Eden was a land adjacent to your own earth, and the lesser Adam dwelt within it, not one man alone but a race from which you yourselves are descended. The greater Eden is the manifest world of which the microcosmic form is complete in each soul, and of which the macrocosmic form is called Nirvana. The Lesser Eden was relatively geographical in its conditions. It was formed of the unifying influence of mind upon matter, and was extension of the individual aura reacting upon the aura of the earth. Within the garden there grew two trees, the Tree of Knowledge and the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is a plant of the world of Atzaloth and belongs to the Absolute. The Tree of Knowledge is of the Briotic or First Relative World. The greater tree of life is the supreme emblem of cosmic being, and its branches are the ten holy sephiroth, the great hierophants of the living mysteries. The roots of the tree are set in the soil of matter, whilst the topmost branch is hidden within the unmanifest, the supernal world. Its roots will reach to the hells, its branches to the ends of the cosmos, and its summit to the uttermost and the unbegotten. The tree of life is the primordial soul, or God. The lesser tree of life is the spine of Adam. It is the spinal column of man, the duct of the pranic juices which flow out through the branches or chakras and nourish the human organism with the immortal essence. It is rooted in that which is material, whilst its apex reaches to that hidden center within the brain whence man may communicate with the unmanifest. The tree of knowledge is the emanating soul or individualization. The roots of knowledge are in matter. The branches reach out into existence, whilst the summit is lost within the veil of the mysteries. The lesser tree of knowledge is the mind of Adam. Its roots are set in science. Its branches are the ten senses, the centers which operate the psychic and physical bodies and involve the entire body and brain. The serpent abode within the tree of life and his body scaled the branches thereof, of the living creatures who attained manifestation upon the earth. The one which was created in spiral form was designated the serpent. The serpent whom you have called wisdom represented those forces inherent within the nature of Adam, which inherited from the macrocosm remained latent within the microcosm. The spiral represents lawful progress, but the rotation may follow from the natural flow or it may oppose this current by reversing. Adam was given dominion over every living thing, but he did not exert his power to control the serpent. So the serpent, through instrumentality of Eve, tempted Adam to disobedience and partook of his fall. Now because he tempted man, is he condemned to the limbless coil of matter. So the wisdom of the gods is degraded. Intellect is imprisoned in the cage of materialism. From the fangs of the serpent issue these poisons, which undefiled might have been inoculations of the elixir of life. The fruit of the tree of knowledge had not ripened. It was newly planted in the new garden of the world, nor was it fruit easy of digestion to the young soul of Adam. The fruit of this tree is symbolical of the juices within the body, and its seeds epitomize the creative forces within the mind of man. In order to force his own development and to acquire the creative power of the overlords, man perverted the juices within his own body. Knowledge of good and evil may be attained only by experience. Adam did take and eat, because the fruit had not ripened and the seeds were immature, the creations of Adam were abortive, and he became conscious of his nakedness before the Lord God, 
Perversion has no substance in the eyes of the Lord God, so the Lord God gave unto him coats of skin, that is, a body of incarnation, a body like the animal that is clothed with skin. The descent of Adam into matter was not a sudden cataclysm, but a gradual decline. Incarnation degenerated into the physical process of which the prophecy was spoken. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Man, having debased the celestial essences, sank into earth, and God set an angel to guard the fruits of the mysteries. For because God beheld the curse which knowledge had become, he intervened to stay a crazy humanity. The sons of God descended to the plain of the daughters of men. There dwelt upon the earth a primitive race, and many eons later there appeared in your world an evolved and independent race, or the first true men. Coordination of matter into form had not progressed to the extent in your present day. It was the contact of the races, each with other, that assisted in the formation of the material earth. Man took one fruit from the tree of knowledge, and having eaten, learned of the juices which were within himself and the secrets of perversion. Wherefore, when it is written that sons of God looked upon the daughters of men, and they were fair, there is implied no beauty of outward form, but a means of gratification of a perverted desire. They strayed from the destined orbit of their being. The children of the sun approaching the earth were vouchsafed bodies in which to manifest. They were not physical bodies such as you possess today, but they were organic and so corresponded to matter. The race was sent to help the children of the earth wrestling with their first incarnation into flesh. Therefore the sons of God glutted wantonly with the knowledge they had stolen and could not digest, strayed from the orbit of their being. To the superterrestrial boundaries of the planet's higher population is given the name Eden in allegory and in history Atlantis. Within the Earth's present surface, the fires were cooling. Matter was evolving, Adam combining with Adam in ceaseless experiment until there was produced a vehicle of sentient life. The creative lords worked in the knowledge of divine law, and evolution advanced according to divine plan. The Father God sent his creative lords to help those souls in darkness, to take dense matter which they had produced and to manipulate it into a sphere wherein they might learn the law of God and redeem themselves through his love and regain eventually the divine world which they had lost. Out of the atomic dust of the universe, God created the earth and evolved a body that should clothe the human soul during its period of incarnation. In the days of Eden, the earth possessed two spheres of activity, the outer containing the inner, the etheric encircling the material upon which was forming the earth's crust, the geography of the earth was formed first in this etheric world, and its character was impressed upon the earth's surface. To this, the Adamic race descended and became subject to the exigencies of matter and to the laws of a three-dimensional world. Eden fell out of heaven and became incorporate in matter. The belt of etheric substance that was about the earth crystallized and contracted so that it became a part of the earth's crust and subject to the laws of physical nature. It was this land that brought forth tars and thistles in a literal sense as well as in the inner meaning that the new world or mind of Adam gave birth to that which was hurtful and destructive. Yet the garden of the Lord remained in heaven, the reward of man's regeneration. The Adamic race were the first inhabitants of your earth whom you would regard as human. At this time the earth crust was formed and the conditions were favorable to life and animal forms were already considerably evolved. The sons of Adam incarnating as immortals brought memory, so the Adamic race in the primitive world worked ceremonial rituals, erected temples, and disseminated knowledge. The sons of Adam found themselves no longer free men, but held in bondage to the earth, bound by gravitation to its surface, answerable to its laws, and limited mentally by the poor capacity of the physical brain. They earned their bread by the sweat of their brow, and the earth brought forth thistles. If human brain cells had not been created, then madness would have ensued. Only the functioning consciousness could inhabit the mortal body. The greater portion of the ego remained still in the mental state. The Adamic race peopled a vast continent that stretched athwart your ocean and spread its tentacles through the fertile valley of the Mediterranean and through lands in Western Asia. This was Atlantis 
a continent born of heaven, in obedience to the laws of physical science, which rule the coagulation of substance and the formation of matter. This occupied eons of mundane time. The fall of Adam was the gradual work of ages. The Adamic race, by their continuous practices and the abasement of their mind, created conditions that were in affinity with the conditions of physical earth. And since affinities are subject to a gravitational draw, they became incorporate with the earth. Chemists may gather elements from the air and may convert them into solids. It was this transmutation that was suffered by the sons of God in their incarnation and by their world in its involution. Upon the continent of Lemuria, forms of life had been evolving since the foundation of the world, and the daughters of men had long since possessed themselves of the physical bodies of incarnation. Evolved by the animal world from the vital properties in matter, for aeons this great race had existed. The children of the original or first fall had progressed through many states of purification and were manifesting in the conditions of a third dimension. It is written that the sons of God united with the daughters of men. The state of your world at the present day is most interesting. There are still a few souls emerging upon it out of a two-dimensional condition, but these are now comparatively few. Most have already incarnated into a three-dimensional aspect of life and are ripe to learn the lessons of the earth, which is sacrifice. At rare intervals, there is an incarnation of a great and holy spirit, and within your own era came the manifestation of the Lord of the world. The sons of God were spirits of comparatively recent individualization who approached the earth's sphere for such experience as would assist the order of their evolution. It was from these emanated the Adamic or greater human race. These spirits were answerable to the lords or oversouls in contact with the plane, who in turn obeyed the will of the blessed archangels, the messengers of the Supreme God. The kingdoms you call Atlantis and Lemuria originally belonged to the fourth dimensional planes and became crystallized through long ages until for a while they were actually material upon your present world. The Atlanteans taught of such celestial matters as they remembered and the race of submen understood inadequately. It is written that Eve brought forth Cain and Abel and Cain slew his brother. So self-will slew the divine will. So his bondage to matter was confirmed and he was shut off from the psychic world. Before the world was formed, the essential constituents of organic life were within the chemical ingredients of matter. Within each particle of the atom was a modicum of spirit or force of life. The spirit was active within them, but it was a vital force, not a cohesive force. The spirit is absolute and not manifesting. The manifesting force is the soul, which represents the attributes of spirit in expression. The expression of life extended and there emerged smaller groups of higher development and thus more complex aspects of nature acquired a state of being. Then, because dense matter was the work of man's hands, the faculty of disobedience stirred in the soul of the world and obeyed the urge of self, so by reason of the original sin of disobedience. The womb of the earth brought forth tars and thistles, and reptiles were born of her, and loathsome beasts and stinging insects. The soul of the world obeyed the urge of self, even as Adam, even as Lucifer, the Oversoul beheld these things, but he might not stay the hand of those who wrought in perversion. To overrule man's free will is to tamper with the powers of God. So the Lord of the world identified himself with the world and sought his own pure nature to purify its perversions, that life might endure and manifestation prevail, so cohesive life prevailed. The Lord of the world in those days of the earth's inception was nailed of his own free will and accord upon the cross of matter, that his blood might flow through the veins of the world, that the earth might preserve its orbit in the universe, and the purpose of its creation be fulfilled. Jesus the carpenter gave his life upon the altar of agony, that through this stupendous cosmic truth might be born in upon the minds of men. It is the embodiment of the oversoul within the processes of matter and the presence of his lifeblood within the arteries of the world, which is the true sacrament. And of this truth, every ceremonial feast is an emblem, not in your Christian world alone, but within all forms of worship. And before the pages of your history came to be written, so cohesive life prevailed, and forms evolved, and the animal kingdom became an established realm of nature. The earth was not in itself the innocent scapegoat, 
The fall of Lucifer had broken the dam of creative power and loosed upon the cosmos a torrent of alchemical properties which primordial man had perverted into decay and death. The universe became sodden with these vitiated juices. The soul of the world, therefore, led by the Lord of the world, presented a sphere wherein death should be translated into life. Poison should become balm, and mortal regain immortality. The perverted emanations of mind projected by the children of darkness took form within evolving matter. Every phase of nature exhibited self-love and self-will. Large vegetable growths preyed upon the lesser and overgrew them. Larger animals fed upon the smaller. Bird and beast killed wantonly for the lust of killing, and when primal man came to inhabit the bodies of the beasts, he too killed and tortured and knew no god but self. The first step in the regeneration of self-will is service, and the regeneration of desire is love. Eve, the desire force who had led Adam to death, now taught him also the way of life. This Eve had not known the Eden of the upper earth, the Eden of the Adamic race, but she had known the primordial Eden of God before the sons of Lucifer had led her forth into the dominion of darkness. Eve, finding herself clothed in the physical body of skin, used her newfound powers and brought forth other souls out of the darkness into the twilight of incarnation. This was the first service. So the first sub-man and sub-woman began their first lesson in service through the means of their parenthood. Thus was populated the great continent of Lemuria, and the earth was peopled with the daughters of men. At this time new people appeared upon the earth, the Atlantean or first true men, these were the sons of Adam, the Skyons of the Adamic race. The gods had walked with their fathers in the cool of the day of creation. Adam was man. His fall was relatively superficial. His loss was suspension of the psychic nature. He no longer beheld the gods who had walked with him in the garden. They became a memory, brought into the brain of incarnation. Within the aura, or etheric planes of each planet dwell highly developed personalities who obey the commands of the ruler of the planet, even as he obeys the holy laws of the supreme God. The sons of God in Atlantis were enabled to behold these personalities. They were the initiators in the cosmic rites. They were kings and princes, and they accepted as manifestations of God, entities whom you now call pagan gods. The early inhabitants of your earth were composite in nature, and were in touch psychically with an immense gamut of forces both good and evil. The faculty of memory inherited by the Atlanteans led them to pursue various practices which had been their habit in the days of their purity. Inspired by the voice of their guiding spirits, they built temples and founded mystery schools and sought contact with that which they had lost. The Atlanteans built temples, but their nature had suffered contamination, and they failed to keep them pure. They worshipped those beings whom they recognized as masters and overlords, but they began to endow them with human qualities and even with human sins. They bandied about the sacred names, attaching them to ribald tales and defiling them in debased rituals. Therefore, the inhabiting spirits withdrew from the form of their names, leaving the empty shells. Spirits withdrew from the form of their names, nevertheless these vehicles still remained among the people and through the ages. There were sages and philosophers and magi who, doing honor to the sacred memories, were able to invoke the spirit to return and manifest again to man. Therefore, from its earliest inception, the world never lacked a positive link with its creator, nor were the sheep of God ever left shepherdless. The Adamic race sought contact with the astral world by means of ceremonial ritual, which produced powerful phenomena. Man invoked the spirits of power and majesty, but he invoked them by such means as their essential holiness could not contact. Therefore they responded to his invocations, the negative aspect of the angels of power, the lords of darkness. So the priests offered obscene oblations in illegitimate ceremonial. The evil ceremonials persisted in through the years, actually reacted upon the elemental forces of nature and were instrumental in bringing about the cataclysm which destroyed Atlantis. The physical causes of the submersion of the continent were natural causes, but they reacted to man's power over nature, a power which man has almost lost in consequence of his misuse of his prerogative. The perversions of man had been of so vile a nature that the very earth, the products of the earth, and its vegetation were saturated 
in evil vibrations. Rank and poisonous growths flourished everywhere, and pestilential weeds encumbered the ground. The crops were blighted. Within the houses, disease and luxury vied for supremacy while starving slaves died. Such were the conditions of the last days of Atlantis. History would give you the Bible story in a different form. Atlantis and Lemuria were destroyed in a series of cataclysms of a volcanic nature. Noah is the name tradition has given to the remnant of the Atlantean race, who had chosen God because they had proclaimed him Lord. They were able to depart before the catastrophe that was the natural product of the causes man himself had set in motion. From the Book of Truth, in the Hall of Learning, Ashar Priest of Ra, Zabdael, and the Hierophant with Apollonius of Tiana, in the Temple of Truth Guides, Marjorie Livingston Transcriptice, Philip Philip Medhurst Editor and Collator, Philip Devere, Pro-Apostle of the Aquarian Church of Christ Promulgator. So this unique and unusual channeling I just had to read for my own entertainment when I find texts like this written almost a hundred years ago, I just love it. You don't have to believe it. It's very similar to the account of the creation story given in my episode on Edgar Cayce and the children of the Law of One. In that one, I talk about a group called the Children of the Law of One, which were discussed by Edgar Cayce in many of his writings that had been around for a long time and had a similar creation story. It's always interesting to look at the story of the Bible as symbolic. For instance, the idea that Noah represents an entire race of people that had left Atlantis before it flooded. Love that idea. It's also reminiscent of the secret doctrine. I read some Manly P. Hall where he sort of outlines what is actually said in the secret doctrine and it's very similar to that as well. The idea that the universe required this negative principle in order for experience to occur and experience is the foundation of ecstasy. Light begat darkness that the positive gave rise to the negative principle. So at some point in universal history, some forces using the divine power went against the divinity and created separation and much of what we see today is a result of that. Certainly possible. When I read stuff like this, I get images and feelings of memories and I see images that there's no way I could describe. It's like a remembering that comes back with me. Little images and bits and pieces and I'm really wondering if anybody else has stuff like that happen too. The children of the sun may be raw. The children of the sun are the original race and there is this group called the children of the sun that are talked about here before you have the creation of the earth and the children of the sun perhaps were the original race from Venus, Ra. They didn't go into detail, they just referred to them as the children of the sun. There are guardians that are created here that are also mentioned in the Law of One and it shows about their origins and how they came about. The true definition of Eden and Eve is great. Eve is this divine feminine principle that is within all of us, that is guiding us and pushing us for knowledge and other things, very much like what Joseph Murphy says, that Eve is the subconscious mind. So there's some unique bits and pieces, and I could discuss this forever. It's interesting that they say that there are incarnations happening on the earth from two places, which is also consistent with the law of one, from the second density, which is second dimension. So you have animals becoming conscious as humans, moving up through spirit life into humanity. Then you have other beings coming down from fourth dimension, becoming third dimensional. So you have this hodgepodge, you have two different types of humanity that are existing on the earth, the ones that are evolving from the second dimension and ones that are coming down from the fourth dimension. There's an explanation of groups of people coming from the astral, where they refer to it as astral, that essentially are star seeds that are coming to help in the development of the race that is described here. There's also a fascinating description and discussion of the Elohim, essentially that coincides with Neville Goddard saying that we're all the Elohim. The Elohim were the initial humans that waited to find incarnations in these animal bodies. Something that 
Ra and Quo always emphasize that we are actually just existing in a second density animal body which carries its own urges and ideas but we are not of that animal body we are from a higher dimension living in this body for experience it's all about experience and notice at the end of this that the key is service that the initial service that we learn in the evolution of human life is when we start taking care of our kids or have family that's when the initial service becomes and so service ends up being the penultimate role of our experience in this dimension so tell me what your favorite part is or if you found some parts of this interesting or if it brought up memories for you just tell me and relate to me in the comments about what you thought of this particular reading of the origins of the earth and the universe you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Please check out my art, which carries a technology that you can use to create and manifest through art sigils. You can find that at www.newearth.art. Thank you so much for joining me in these explorations. It's such a joy to be able to share it with someone and talk about it. So thank you, and I love you so much. Sending all the love and light to everyone listening, and welcome to the Reality Revolution. Mm -hmm.